Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Philadelphia Fight, for welcoming us here again today. Um, I'm Dr. Dominique Verdreen, and I am a member and going to be your co-facilitator for today um, from Speaking Down Barriers. Um, if some of you were here with us yesterday, welcome back. We're happy to have you here again. If you're new to us, um, welcome. We are very thankful to have this opportunity to come. Um, Speaking Down Barriers is an organization that was in inception since six and a half years ago, um, and it was created in the lovely Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, we are a nonprofit organization um, comprised of artists, healers, creatives, writers, theologians, educators, and impassioned individuals who believe that our differences, um, which is often seen as a, a source of contention in our society, can actually be seen as a source of strength. We believe that our differences, as human as they are, um, are actually ability, can serve as an ability for us to connect with one another. Um, that being said, we also want to share with you that um, what we're sharing with you today is one way and one path and one framework in which we think would help us to have um, restorative dialogues, um, specifically with regards to anti-Blackness. We also believe it's important that you understand that we don't claim to be experts on this. We are on this journey with you. And um, while we're on this journey with you, we strive and do our best to do better um, each day. And so we really want you to be aware of that as we um, delve into this dialogue with one another. As Kyle stated, um, because we're utilizing a virtual platform, this is not how we, Speaking Down Bears, normally um, facilitate dialogues. We love to be in person and have that um, dialogue facilitated in that, on that platform, but that's not feasible due to COVID-19. And so we ask that you have grace um, with regards to any potential technical difficulties that may occur. Um, and we really just want to urge you to be in this process with us. So today I have with me um, Davlin Hill as well as Scott Neely. They are going to be our co-facilitators for today, my co-facilitators. Um, we want to tell you a little bit about our mission with Speaking Down Barriers. So um, we believe in equity for all. And we believe that there's two strategic imperatives that we can utilize to help us reach that mission. Um, we believe in ending all forms of oppression, right? So while we focus on primarily on um, ending, primarily focusing on racism, we also understand it's important for us to be aware of um, and attend to other ways in which people are oppressed in our society, whether it be your religious perspectives, whether it be um, disabilities that individuals have, whether it be um, individuals, um, citizen, citizenship status, level of education, all forms of oppression. Um, in order for us to end oppression, we need to end all forms of oppression. And we also believe it's vital for us to value everyone. Uh, and that can be challenging at times, especially when we've been harmed by other people. And we just think that it's important to be able to still see the humanity in individuals apart from the behaviors that they may have engaged in that have been very painful for us. So we strive for equity for all by focusing on ending all forms of oppression and also valuing everyone. Add my thanks to um, uh, those of Dr. Vadreen uh, for having us with you for a second day of training. We're really honored to do this work with you, um, to speak, and hear very challenging truths about our lives, our lives as a people, our lives as a society, um, and to express our hope and to hear your hope for a better world, a world that we believe we can create. Uh, our theme uh, is anti-Blackness, healing through restorative dialogue. And dialogue is one of the key ways that we work as an organization. And even in this virtual format, with its limitations, we will engage with you in dialogue today. I want to thank everyone who made comments in the chat and also uh, who spoke comments yesterday. Um, those were very valuable in the moment, but our team also took those comments. We read a transcript of those comments uh, yesterday evening and processed them and worked with them again early this morning. Uh, we really value hearing what people have to say and making this interactive. Even though this is the last day of our training with you, 
I want to urge you to put comments in the chat uh, when the chat opens. Because again, after the session is over today, our team will read those comments and discuss them. This is one form of dialogue and we want to thank you for engaging that with us. When we engage in dialogue and talk about difficult things, we want that dialogue to go deep and challenge us. It's not about superficiality. This is not about maintaining the status quo. This is not about arriving at agreement or leaving feeling like um, everything's okay now. Quite the opposite. This is about touching the deepest parts of ourselves and challenging ourselves to live in the truth together. And so we have a set of agreements that we offer to guide our thinking so that we can confront a question and end it, all the while valuing one another. Just to move through these quickly as we went through them yesterday. First is that we show up and choose to be present. Then when we feel the desire to evade the tension of the dialogue, when the subject gets too difficult, we want to check out mentally or physically to return to the space, recenter, show up again, show up over and over again. Staying in the tension is some of the most important work that we can do. I speak from my own experience. We all bring truth, and all of our truth is incomplete. I honor you by listening to your truth, and you honor me by listening to mine. When I speak from my experience, I speak most clearly the truth that I hold without generalizing. So we ask this of all of us. Speak the truth that you know. We can all hear it and learn from it. I will speak and listen with unconditional positive regard, not a place of perfection for ourselves or for other people. We do strive for excellence, but we don't demand perfection of one another. Instead, we believe that we've chosen here to do the work of with the very best of intentions, and we hold each other with that regard. I will not be a frequent voice. If my voice is overwhelming, if it's dominating, then I'm silencing others. So you make space for me to speak. I make space for you. I will not try to be right or perfect. None of us can be. We're all stuck in this system in which we've been born into. This we've been born. Uh, we can't possibly get it all right. We can make it a whole lot better. So let go of perfectionism. Drive instead for teamwork and excellence. Something is not said. I will say it. It's not possible for our training team to cover every possible topic or to know every every life and every life circumstance. When something is not said, we urge you not to leave it unsaid, but to be an active and engaged participant in the dialogue and speak. There's a place for your voice and we want to hear what you see. It's okay that we didn't see it. It matters that you're here and that you see it. Please share it with us. I'll treat what is shared in this space as sacred and hold it in confidence. Uh, this is a place of dialogue and vulnerability. We're not here to disclose to other people what's said in this space. We want to honor one another. And the sacredness of being able to speak our truth with vulnerability. This uh, is being recorded for other people to on afterward. Um, but as participants, we ourselves will not record this. We honor the confidence with which everyone here speaks. These are our agreements to guide us today. Like I said earlier, my name is Davlin, and um, I too want to uh, say thank you uh, for yesterday's wonderful um, kind of dialogue and for all of you who've joined us today. Um, I am the program director for Speaking Down Barriers and a facilitator and um, just really uh, excited to be here this morning. Um, we're going to move through um, <clears throat> some an additional way that we build um, a container for each other, and that's just by getting on the same uh, page with uh, breathing and also with uh, setting intentions for our time together. Um, so we're just going to start out um, doing some um, breathing exercises together and I just want to say that um, sometimes it's difficult for us to be able to breathe together and um, if you can't um, hold with the way that I breathe I just encourage you to to breathe in whatever way makes you comfortable um, so that you can um, be more present um, here today. So um, if, I encourage you to close your eyes, um, but if you can't do that for whatever reason, um, you can use, just kind of stare and um, use a, 
a spot in your home to kind of gaze at. And um, if you're with us and you're visually impaired, um, I just encourage you to, um, in whatever way makes you comfortable, uh, breathe with us and um, yeah, you don't have to visualize. So I'm just gonna take three breaths together. Um, I'm gonna count us, so one, two, three, breathe in. Hold your breath. And exhale. Again, one, two, three, inhale. Hold your breath. Exhale. This last time when we breathe together, just want you to um, think about all the things that you're carrying and um, maybe feel them gathering together in your stomach. And then as we exhale, just imagine everything flowing out of you um, and leaving you without the things that, the extra things that you're carrying. So we're gonna breathe in, one, two, three. Hold and gather all those things. And then see them leaving. And right now we want you to think about what you need to uh, lay down to be able to enter into this conversation. And there can be a host of things that you need to lay down. Maybe there's busyness or a to-do list or uh, thinking about family, or whatever it is. So I want you to think about laying that thing down and then what you can offer to the space together. Um, so I'm going to lay down distractions and bring it into this space um, patience, patience and curiosity. So when you think about that, what do you need to lay down and then what can you bring into the space? And we wanna uh, open up the opportunity for you to put those things um, in the chat. Just those two things, what you need to lay down and what you're bringing in. Um, type those things. And if you um, don't have the ability to type, we just encourage you to say those out loud wherever you are. Um, because even though we can't hear you, we just, we know that the intention in bringing those things is really important. So, I see that people need to lay down distractions and bringing in open mindedness, um, laying down sadness, emails, to do lists, stress, thoughts about um, where our country is going. And then people are bringing in more happiness and um, laying down some negativity and anxiety. trying to be really good for our families, bringing in more curiosity, grace, joy, listening care, hope, healing. There's very great offerings into this space and I wanna, I wanna thank you for that. So we all exist um, on in different spaces. Um, I'm in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and um, I'm able to be in this space um, because of the stewardship of the land of the Cherokee peoples, uh, Saluda, the Catawba. Um, they took care of the land that I'm on. And so I just wanna take us through um, just a, a little bit of a, a guided meditation. And at the same time, I wanna offer that uh, if you can't exist, if you don't exist in the world in the way that I do, um, I want you to encourage you to imagine you doing it for you. So if you have problems with um, dexterity, uh, movement, um, <laughs> like I do, then maybe you will imagine uh, just sitting on the ground in whatever way you can connect to the land. So if you'll just close your eyes with me and imagine the last time you were able to really connect to the land. I know it's been a while for many of us um, having to <laughs> live in our houses, um, but just imagine the last time you were able. Maybe you were at the beach or you were um, outside in your yard or um, maybe you do it through um, videos, even watching those online, but whatever way you were able to connect to the land, I want you to go to that place. <sighs> And like I said before, if you're visually impaired, maybe there are ways that you can think about the way you felt the outside through um, the wind or through the taste of the air, or maybe through ways that you could hear, or maybe you were able to, to put your hand um, on the grass and, and rub across, or maybe you have a garden and that you were able to, to think of the first fruits that you brought forth. Just go that place with me. And I want you to just, Take a deep breath. 
and imagine just how thankful you were for that space. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? What did you touch? What did you smell? What did you taste? And we want to just really be thankful for the people, the indigenous people who stewarded the land so that we were able to, to have that feeling, to be able to be in that space. Because in many of the places that we are, the indigenous folks were murdered, besought with illness, and pushed off of the land forcefully through the Trail of Tears. We just want to say thank you to these people who did steward the land so well. And even though um, white supremacy has sought to make those people disappear, we say, we see you. We acknowledge you, we hear you, and we say thank you. So we're gonna hold for about 20 seconds in whatever way you can say thank you. Yes, that you do that. Thank you. Thank you, Davlin. I'm gonna offer a short recap of what we talked about yesterday, just to, to, um, to bring us all up to the, the point at which we are today. The theme of this webinar is anti-blackness, healing through restorative dialogue. And one of the main points that we wanted to offer yesterday uh, is the understanding that anti-blackness uh, is a result of white supremacy. That since before the formation of our nation, uh, there have been efforts to create a system of, of privileged people of European descent over all other people, very elaborate hierarchy uh, of uh, discrimination and privilege and oppression that creates a stable and persistent system uh, that, uh, that values and perpetuates white. White supremacy is that system. White privilege are the benefits and the privileges that accrue to people of European descent. Uh, and white fragility is the reactionary aspect of this, often expressed by people of European descent when confronted with the realities of white supremacy and racism. White fragility, uh, even when it shows up in something as simple as tears or as dismissiveness or defensiveness, is a very, very powerful way in which white supremacy continues to establish itself and perpetuate itself. All of these things are based on anti-blackness, holding people of African descent uh, at the bottom of the racialized hierarchy, all in order to vaunt and establish white dominance. So <clears throat> as we, uh, as Scott talked about earlier, we really take seriously um, things shared with us and to be able to dialogue with um, the people <clears throat> in any training or, or any dialogue that we're a part of. And so because of the way this is set up, um, it's hard for us to hear from all of you, but many of you spoke into the chat, your thoughts and feelings um, about what we were just discussing. And so we wanted to just kind of bring that so that everybody could maybe be closer to the same page and so that you could see um, some of the things that were, were shared in the chat yesterday. So what did we hear about dialogue and how it promotes healing? Well, we heard that dialogue promotes healing when people feel heard, um, when um, there's listening and acknowledgement that promotes healing, um, when it's rooted in, in compassion and solution focused, definitely when there's empathy. I mean, what, how do you feel when someone is able to enter into your shoes or into your into your circumstance and you feel that kind of bonding with people that's really um healing when it's non-judgmental um, who likes to be judged 
and when we can see positive change. Um, those are things that you said um, over and over. We saw those things kind of lifted up in the dialogue. The next question was, um, where do you see anti-blackness show up? And so we just kind of took some of the main kind of threads. Uh, many of the things were um, said uh, multiple times. Uh, but just, so these are some ideas that were, that were brought up about anti-blackness showing up. Um, it shows up in our own community, in the, in the black community. Um, when people use the term or talk about being colorblind um, and how that kind of uh, can make people feel erased and anti-blackness. It shows up as white fragility. Shows up when people retreat um, in fear of being called racist. Um, when there is minimizing and underreaction of police shootings, and um, when people use protests as a reason to dismiss important issues. Um, it also shows um, in classrooms where Black, Indigenous, people of color are tokenized or taxed with um, educating white students. It also shows up when um, Black people who buy into white supremacy demean or disregard or dismiss other black people. You also um, said that in the medical treatment when people don't take symptoms seriously or when they try to, um, to, to say that your pain isn't real. Um, it shows up in the black necks desire to assimilate, which sometimes leads to internalized depression. It shows up in uh, immigrant communities um, denying their blackness and then they have to deal with that cognitive dissonance between I am black, but I'm also don't want to be treated like black people um, in America. So how can I, how can I not have to do that? Um, not knowing how to have comfortable conversations and then sitting with discomfort is hard. So um, yeah, when that happens, that, that can show up in black anti-blackness. Um, also, when the Department of Social Services doesn't trust black single moms um, to care for their for their children and sometimes to take them out of the home or not realize that many times black people have a community kind of people of raising children. And so that's not taken into account because our, our cultures are different um, or when people use blackness as the face of a movement, um, but then black people aren't in behind the doors where the decisions are made. So these are some things that um, we, we saw. Um, in the chat. And so thank you so much for sharing. We ask that, we do ask that you continue to do that today so we can even continue this dialogue and you influence um, um, our thinking about these subjects as well. We want to think just a little bit more with you about the way in which white supremacy operates and the way that it creates anti-blackness. Uh, and one of the key things that we can see when we look across our nation's history is that white supremacy is highly effective in perpetuating itself. It is a very adaptive um, of power uh, built to preserve its own power. White supremacy constantly adapts to preserve its power. I want to offer just one example of this for you. Uh, we talk all the time about the civil rights movement, about the power of nonviolent protest and the social change that happened in the 1960s after decades and decades, if not centuries, of uh, efforts to build a more equitable nation. In August 6, 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed, a piece of landmark civil rights legislation, finally giving um, people of color, particularly Black people in the South, access to the vote. We've already uh, seen in some of the comments today concern about disenfranchisement and voter suppression. And the Voting Rights Act was uh, a major move uh, to, uh, to overcome Jim Crow laws and the ways in which um, uh, Black communities were disenfranchised. On November 29th, 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. announced uh, the Poor People's Campaign, which was the next step in uh, the work of the civil rights movement under Dr. King's leadership. The idea of the Poor People's Campaign was to push beyond civil rights into economic rights, uh, and to do so by creating a multi-ethnic coalition, particularly of white and black poor people, uh, to advocate for better jobs and better pay. It's very telling, as we looked at yesterday, the history of white supremacy in our country began as an economic uh, motive 
power for the sake of greed, press a multi-ethnic coalition um, in the Bacon's Rebellion in the Virginia colony. And indeed, uh, when Dr. King advanced the War People's Campaign, that is when he was assassinated. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. King um, organizing uh, in Memphis on behalf of sanitation workers, fair treatment and pay for their labor was killed. On May 12th uh, until late June, the Poor People's Campaign nonetheless happened in Washington uh, and protesters advocated for economic justice in a multi-ethnic coalition. And then on August 8th, 1968, Richard Nixon accepted the presidential nomination of the Republican Party. And what is notable about that moment, after all the civil rights gains that had been made and the fight for economic justice in a multi-ethnic coalition and the assassination of Dr. King, that Richard Nixon ran on a law and order platform. I will not hide the fact that we are hearing a lot of this same rhetoric today. And I want to show you the next slide to see what happened when the presidential campaign in 1968 moved to frighten white voters, particularly white Southern voters, mm -hmm. uh, through a law and order campaign and through the criminalization of people of color uh, around uh, drug use. You can see on this chart the, uh, the, the prison population in the United States year by year since 1925. You can see that at the very moment of landmark civil rights legislation, and at the very moment in which a multi-ethnic coalition fighting for economic justice coalesced, leader of that movement, Dr. King was assassinated and a presidential candidate was elected who ushered in what came to be called the War on Drugs. Richard Nixon's campaign in 1968 and the criminalization of communities of color based on drug use. And in 1971, he officially launched the War on Drugs. And look at what happened to the prison population in the United States. Skyrocketed the most people incarcerated by its own nation than any other nation in human history. And this population uh, works for pennies on the dollar for large corporations to make billions mm -hmm. in profits based on the products produced by that virtual slave population in prisons, what we call mass incarceration. The purpose of this slide is to show you that from slavery to, from enslavement to sharecropping to Jim Crow to mass incarceration, a system of controlling population, power for the sake of greed, perpetuates itself over and over again, even at the moment of landmark civil rights legislation and of a multi-ethnic coalition forming to fight for economic justice, even at that moment that we praise as a high point in our nation's history, a turning point for us all was at that moment, white supremacy found a new iteration in order to control labor and exploit people for economic gain, this time through mass incarceration. And this is where we find ourselves today. White supremacy is ingenious. And we need to know this if we're going to change it. Wow, Scott. Um... I know we talked about this, but I never saw you explain this, this slide. Um, and that was very um, impactful for me in seeing that. Um, very painful to see the, the, the visual. Um, and so I do wanna thank you for helping us and walking us through that and seeing just how um, white supremacy is adaptable, right? Um, and so while we know our culture is fluid, it is also very fluid um, and, and changes for the purposes of maintaining said power and greed. Um, which brings us to understanding and talking about structural racism, right? So that was a very 
um, good example of structural racism. Um, but how is it expressed as white privilege? And so I want us um, to discuss this a little bit further. Um, and so when we think about white privilege, there's some people who see it clearly, and then there's other people who have trouble seeing it, right? And it's like, how can you not, how can you not see this? It's clear as day. Um, but it's kind of like a fish um, in a, in a fishbowl full of water. Kind of like asking that fish, how do you not know you're wet, right? If you're in that culture um, and you're swimming in said culture long enough, it becomes invisible. So you don't see it, especially if there's some benefit that you're receiving from it. Almost seems like this is just how it's supposed to be. Uh, whereas individuals who are negatively impacted on the receiving end of that disadvantage um, can see it clearly because they're feeling it. It's negatively impacting their lives day in, day out. Uh, so I, I really want us to talk about this a little bit more, just understanding and talking about how that can happen. So I would like to um, get your perspective, Davlin, as well as Scott, as to why it is that some people um, are better able to see white privilege as opposed to others. I think what you just said was a great, uh, a great picture. You know, when you're in a culture, you don't necessarily uh, see the things about that culture because you've been living them as part of your, your whole, your whole life. Um, when I lived overseas, I lived in in Inner Mongolia, um, in for a while, <clears throat> for a few years, and I would, you know, ask questions <laughs> about the culture and be like, "Why do you do this?" And they're like, "I don't understand. That's what everybody does." You're like, "No." no, that's not, it's not really what everybody does. And so just trying to, you know, understand the culture and then bringing things to people to see that they can go, oh, wow, that is kind of interesting. Um, one thing that was especially interesting yesterday, I talked about internalized racism and like being called an Oreo sometimes. And that in where I was, they, uh, people would call each other um, bananas, um, like yellow on the outside, white on the, in the middle, so just kind of like the same picture. And I thought, whoa, like, <laughs> That that idea um, uh, in like white supremacy of internalized racism has gone everywhere. It's global, <laughs> and to hear those kinds of things like help me connect with people. Uh, I was called an Oreo, so you know <laughs> I get it. And um, so like that's a that's something about white privilege. What do you call? You, you don't call. Like, there's no thing for white people, you know, like in that respect because they're seen as as the center, right? In the both pictures, white people are the center and we are being, you know, on the outside trying to be like them. And I think that's white privilege where your, your culture is the dominant culture. So you don't have to think about it like that as the way we do. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, normative thinking has a lot to do with this as well. You know, I, I'm a white guy and um, I am grateful for who I am. I love myself and I'm proud to be who I am. Um, and, and part of that is being aware as much as I'm able um, through the limitations of my perspective uh, for understanding uh, how I show up in the world and what proves to me because of that and what responsibilities I bear because of that. Um, but I think for white folks and for me constantly, uh, so I speak from my own experience, um, there is a, a, a norm, an expectation that something is just normal that makes it very hard to see uh, that the world we're living in is not normal at all. Uh, standards of beauty, standards of education, standards of employment, what neighborhood you live in, all these things are very uh, normalized. And therefore, to try to think beyond that is actually quite difficult. It's hard to imagine out of it. Um, so um, now I'm a minister and I was raised in a religious family. I'm a very religious person myself. Uh, morality is a big part of that. The family I grew up in uh, spoke ardently about morality. Um, and yet there were highly racialized images on the walls of the houses of my family members. Um, there were clear disparities in our workplaces and no one had an, a, an idea that they were being unjust or unkind or cruel by portraying those images or by having those disparities in the workplace because they were by their lights, genuinely good people. And, and, and in many ways they were but they were sunk in a system of privilege that they couldn't even see. And therefore the morality that they claimed um, was undermined 
by the culture in which um, uh, we, we were all living. I'll give one more example. Um, where I went to college, um, a little liberal arts college, a great, a great college that I love, and I've taught at, the, at that college since then. Uh, it was on a street called Church Street. And uh, it was on North, North Church Street. The downtown of the city is right in the middle. And then it was a black neighborhood uh, on South Church Street. So you have North Side, South Side, all along Church Street. Um, south Side on Church Street was uh, perceived as a place of danger, of drug use, of policing. It's not a place um, that a person like me would normally go at night. Uh, and um, this prestigious liberal arts college was less than a mile away on North Church Street, just on the other side of downtown. Uh, I can guarantee you there was drug use going on that campus. There was so much going on in dorm rooms and in frat houses. Um, and it was policed mostly by uh, campus police on bicycles. Very, very rarely would you ever see uh, a police car come through. And um, that behavior was completely normalized, not only for the campus, and for the student, but for the entire city. That's just what it was. And when we pull back and look at it, think, oh my God, look at the disparity. That's a gross disparity. But very few people, I will not say none, because some people saw it very clearly, but very few people, including people teaching ethics on that college campus and uh, chaplains on that college campus, and people of very high philosophical and moral standing on that campus, very few ever even thought to say, this is not right. We have to change the disparity. And, and if you think about how formative college years would be for people who have the opportunity to go to college, that that's what you're living in for four years and it sets the trajectory for the rest of your life and your career, your expectations and your personal formation. Uh, it's, it's a, it is a level of normative thinking that is very hard to Until an experience or a friend or something jars you out of it. Yep. And then there's an opportunity to to the jar. Oh, Can you repeat the last part you said? I'm sorry, Scott. Yeah. It, it often takes something to jar you out of it. But people don't take very often. It's true. They don't take well to jarring. <laughs> you get lots of responses. It's, it's a disruption to our worldview. It, what do you mean? What? Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that because it's so challenging. It is very, very challenging um, for me uh, as a black woman. Um, when I'm, it, it's like glaringly, like it's there. Like, how could you not see this? That this is so what's happening. Just look at all the magazines, look at all, you know, um, the shows, the majority of the shows have people that look like you. They don't look like me. They don't look like Asian individuals. They're able-bodied individuals. So it's like, how do you not see that? But then when you explain it, like if this is, if, if your racialized group has been the norm and the standard, it makes total sense, right? And I can see, well, if you just be more like me, we wouldn't have this issue. Like, goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a place where anti-blackness really plays in because it's used as a contrast to that normativity, right? So uh, black people, particularly in media, are, are criminalized, demonized. We've already talked about political campaigns that intentionally do that in order to create campaigns of fear, in order to mm -hmm. generate votes. Um, we hear that being done with white suburban voters today in campaigns um, and threats that are, that are leveled um, if you don't vote a certain way. Um, all of that is anti-blackness meant to buttress Asian white supremacy. And it does it by casting a person like me in a good light. If you're a good person, this is what you do. And by casting someone like you, Dominique, or you, Davlin, in a negative light. Don't be like them, right? And thus, anti-blackness is created uh, so, that, so that white privilege doesn't have to see itself and just keep it important. Yeah, and I just want to take a uh, just a second about people who are um, not not able-bodied or deal with some sort of of disability, like myself. It, the the uh, push is to hide hide us away, right? Oh well, if you can't breathe that well and you're an oxygen, then maybe you should just you know stay at home. Or if you don't um, 
show up in the world like like the majority and whatever disability then you just need to be you know go hide you away or put you to the side and that's and that that makes that does make me feel like an enemy or uh, somebody who's not as good as everybody else in the way they show up in the world. And so that's something that white privilege does as well. Normal, the normal. If you don't fit in there for whatever reason, then let's just kind of hide you away or um, or make you make work really really hard to get access to the same things that we have. Yeah, and and part of that too is because once again that comfort. I feel uncomfortable and because I feel uncomfortable, I just prefer to hide you. Yeah. Right. Because you're challenging me, whether it's a jarring experience or whether it's my inability to understand, whatever the situation is, I'm feeling uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and I don't want to feel uncomfortable. So I rather just have you not be around. So I don't have to deal with that discomfort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. And and I did want to say too, Scott, when when you were sharing that, I did, I I got really viscerally angry. I can feel it. Uh, in my chest and in my stomach, I was just like Clint. Arr! So, so, so much rage to kind of yes. see the see the timeline and talk about it in that way it was like, and I knew it was coming. <laughs> and so, I just wonder about everybody else uh, who's with us today. And so, if you were able to kind of notice where you were feeling the tension, whether it was you know in the head, maybe you have a headache, or maybe your jaw is clenched, or maybe your stomach. And so, I just want to encourage you to m- take note of that. In, in that feeling that you have in, in your body and just take a moment to breathe deeply that, that we're here together <laughs> in this space. And so, you know, just want to you know, <sighs> breathe and notice and just realize kind of what, you know, Black people carry around every, every day as we're talking about this anti-Blackness. And, and perhaps that will to lead you to, to some of the other things that we're going to talk about soon and, and ways to, to make change. So uh, a third way that white supremacy um, uh, help us through white fragility, which is what we're touching on now. I want to just say when you talk about the stress in your body, Davlin, and the anger that you felt when I was going through the history, even when you knew to anticipate it, um, we know that there is documented evidence and, and ample anecdotal evidence um, that constant racialized stress over a lifetime has um, serious uh, deteriorating and debilitating physical effects on a person's medical condition. And we know this from uh, rates of um, illness and mortality. And so we're not just talking about feeling bad. We're talking about anti-blackness as something that is lethal um, and that uh, is, um, uh, it's, not, it's not only cultural, it is actually anti-human. Right. Um, and so I want to talk just for a moment about white fragility in a slightly different way than sometimes we hear about it. White fragility is the responsiveness of white people uh, to uh, being challenged on white supremacy by becoming defensive. The defenses can show up in many ways. One, one very common way is tears, uh, breaking into crying. Um, another way is anger or rage blowing up. Um, Another way is running away, evading the conversation. All of these are defense mechanisms. Uh, And uh, it can be difficult to talk about this, but something to notice in all those defense mechanisms is that they recenter whiteness and white people in the conversation. If we're having a difficult conversation about, oh, let's say anti-blackness, and suddenly I blow up and start to scream and yell about how people aren't being fair or I'm not being heard, and suddenly I have become the center of the conversation, even though ostensibly we're here to talk about anti-blackness. It reinforces centering white people and white supremacy. Robin D'Angelo um, is a noted scholar on this, uh, sometimes controversial, and I don't agree with everything that she says, and I don't agree with, with all the ways that she says it, but uh, her book on white fragility does say a lot of things that we have found to be true in our work last year. We see it a lot. And there is a reframing of the work of, on white fragility that I think is really valuable that she offers. Reframing this work as a work of gratitude, right? It says when we are given feedback, no matter how it comes, um, that's feedback that I need. 
it's not a challenge to my personhood. It's trying to help me grow as a person, to be a better person. And so a good response is to say, thank you. Thank you for saying this to me. Um, I didn't set this system up. Um, it does unfairly benefit me. Inevitably, I use it to my advantage because I'm deeply sunk in it and I can't see it all. And therefore, I bear responsibility for helping to interrupt it. That's part of my work. And as we've said before, the way that I can do that work best is if there are things that jar me out of normative thinking, be in a new way. That's how we're going to be able to do the work of transformation, particularly as white people, to see with new clarity. And, and therefore, when someone challenges me, rather than brace and get defensive, if I can be aware of my emotions, even my emotions of feeling guilty and defensive, um, and not be reactive, I can respond instead with gratitude to say, thank you for helping me see this. Now, I may not even totally agree with you, but thank you for challenging me on this so that I can further the work of transformation. I to really challenge my fellow white folks uh, that when we feel defensive, as we will, it's just part of how we've been wired. To take a deep breath and shift to gratitude. And when we feel guilt, which is an appropriate emotional response, that we not get stuck in guilt. Guilt is appropriate as a, as a feeling to feel and to pass through, but not as a place to get stuck because it has a way of recentering. What we want to move towards instead is gratitude, solidarity, finding ways to move forward. That is totally possible. White supremacy wants to hide that from us cannot take that from us. We can reclaim that power to work with our siblings. I want to show you a video uh, about uh, white fragility. And again, we don't agree with everything that Robin D'Angelo has to say, um, but there's a lot here that is worth seeing and also the experience of it is worth going through. So we want to offer you this video. It has good content, but also if you find yourself becoming angry or defensive, or if you're a white person, we want to encourage you to practice that shift from defensiveness to gratitude. If, if I feel defensive about this, maybe it's something I need to think about. I don't have to wind up agreeing with it, but this is something good for me to consider. So we're going to do this video not only for the information, but for the experience as a practice of shifting from defensiveness to gratitude. How do you feel when you see a headline like this? Or this? If you're white, you might feel uncomfortable, guilty, or even angry. In this video, we're going to talk about why that happens and how to overcome it. Most white Americans don't realize our culture protects us from having to truly confront racial inequality which gives us a major blind spot when it comes to understanding what the reality of systemic racism is for people of color, or how complicit we may be in their oppression. We think of racism as something bad people engage in, instead of something we are conditioned into from childhood. As a result, when indirect, unconscious, or less obvious forms of racism and discrimination are exposed for what they are, it challenges our beliefs about ourselves and our world, provoking our own blind spots when it comes to race. And more often than not, well, let's just say we don't handle it well. The phrase was invented by Robin D'Angelo, a multicultural education expert, to talk about what happens consciously and unconsciously when white Americans are confronted with challenges to white dominance. According to D'Angelo, even a minimal amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves, including the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors wind up preserving the status quo, 
protecting white comfort and therefore reinstating white dominance. White fragility is triggered by interruptions in which white codes of discourse are broken to force a white person to confront racism, and they show up in a number of different ways. Like when anyone, white or otherwise, suggests that a white person's viewpoint is racist. When people of color talk candidly about their experiences of racism. When people of color choose not to share stories or answer questions about their racial experience. And especially whenever people of color choose not to protect the racial feelings of white people. Some other instances of racial stress include when white people are denied access to black safe spaces or black bodies. When white people are told their actions have racist impacts. When racial inclusivity gets prioritized over group membership. When double standards are exposed. When white meritocracy is challenged by exposing white privilege. Whenever white centrality is challenged by narratives in which people of color are front and center without being presented stereotypically. And finally, when a person of color holds a position of leadership. Whatever the cause, knee-jerk overreactions protect white dominance by silencing non-white voices and segregating whites from people of color. By distancing ourselves from racially stressful situations and refusing to consider other perspectives, white people take advantage of the very race privilege we claim not to have. As long as white people require conversations about race to be comfortable for us, racial equality will be a lot harder to achieve. So what do we do when our rules stand in the way of dealing constructively with racism? The answer is, we break the rules. The best way to defeat white fragility is to grow a thicker skin. Build your racial stamina by following some do's and don'ts. Don't assume you are objective or an authority on the experiences of people of color. In a racialized society, whites inevitably have a blind spot. Resist the urge to get defensive when people of color speak honestly about their experiences. Catch yourself whenever you find yourself thinking that a black person's perspective is divisive or abusive. That's often a sign that you lack understanding. Don't recenter a conversation or narrative involving race around you or your feelings. Instead, cede the floor to your neighbors of color to amplify and learn from their perspectives. Explore the complexity of individuals you disagree with or don't understand. Your realities are totally different, and you will never breach that divide by running away from or silencing uncomfortable exchanges. Before getting angry, think about the root cause or need behind someone's emotional outburst or complaint. What you're interpreting as impoliteness or vitriol may be the best available means for them to express their experience of racism. Remember, in this society, white people are safer, included, and seen by default. The same is not true for people of color, which is why forcing them to shoulder the burden of fighting for equality, requiring them to be friendly and helpful in the face of white ignorance, and expecting them to give white people the benefit of the doubt, is not only wrong but also makes well-meaning white people complicit in their oppression. Choosing not to be sensitive in a world that already shelters you will improve your racial resiliency, lead to better relationships with your black and brown friends and neighbors, and most importantly, create necessary space for the equality and justice that people of color deserve. And just say again, um, our purpose is not to agree with the content of the video or with anything that um, that we share as facilitators, uh, but to challenge white supremacy, to transform the world we live in, 
and to stop anti-blackness. Uh, we want a world of equity. And so um, we shared this, uh, this kind of content, not for agreement, push us to think and to ask ourselves, how can I disrupt the systems of oppression in which we all live? How can I be an agent of transformation? And so whatever our experience of video and um, of the other parts of the presentation are, that is the question that we want to put towards. How do we make change happen? Are we agents of change? Thank you, Scott. So we want to take a moment now and delve into a dialogue about how can we address structural racism together? How do we go about addressing structural racism together? So if you wouldn't mind, we're going to go ahead and open the chat. Um, we'd like for you to share your responses in the chat with us. Um, and then we'd also like to hear from, to hear your voices, um, literally. So if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, um, and our moderator will assist us with this, and then we'll um, ask you to go ahead and speak once we um, unmute your mics. Wonderful. So, thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you, thank you everyone. And um, as I uh, usher people in from an attendee's role, to uh, have the ability to speak. Just bear with us as you go from one uh, modality to another. So thank you. Um, so once again, uh, just share in the chat and I will be, it looks like we have one participant who is willing to speak. I am about to allow them to talk. Christopher? Hello? All right. I am asking this individual to unmute themselves. And just as a note to our audience, um, it, depending on your device, it may take a second for uh, you to connect. All right, it looks like this individual is having a little bit of a trouble connecting their mic, so. So one participant shared, I make myself available to sit at the table and become involved in the discussion about race. I speak up and out to help bring awareness to these situations that focuses on racism. Thank you for that. How else do we address structural racism together? So it looks like we have another individual, so I'm going to attempt to allow them to speak. And you may go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I actually, um... I see it a lot, the race, structural racism together like um, in my own communities. I feel the important thing would be is to have that individual because we can't go um, be arguing without the, with them. Um, I think having an open-minded, listening to each other and then also addressing um, what is actually racism about, um, such as giving them examples, um, but also telling them that, you know, I think explaining to them um, that it is not the right way how without arguing and causing a lot of um, commotion because I feel like if we do that we won't be able to get to a point and I think that is the most um, problems that we are having these days because we are not going to get to the same point by arguing so I feel like doing that um, would also be helpful. Thank you so much for sharing that it can be very challenging if we are arguing. Um, we're not taking the time to actually listen um, to one another. So it is important for us to be, to have a, a, a space where we can um, listen and hear what other individuals are saying um, and also be open to learning and also sharing so that other individuals can learn as well. In the chat, we have um, a, a powerful way to address structural racism is by actively participating in the political process, exercising the right to vote, holding leaders accountable, and knowing their agendas and platforms. Another individual stated, um, another way to address, for us to address structural racism together is by accepting people for who they are. Um, we were all created differently in every way. Thank you. And it looks like we have someone out. Oh. They just lowered their hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Once again, please feel free to write your responses um, to this question, how do we address structural racism together? Um, please put, feel free to continue putting your responses in the chat as we move on. Thank you. It looks like that person raised their hand again there, Tammy Daniels. All right, I'm going to allow them to speak. Bear with us but a moment. So from the chat, we have educating others is the biggest way to change this. Um, people don't know if they don't know. And another participant stated, I'd have to say holding the people close and around us accountable for their actions. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have Tammy with us. Good morning to everyone, good morning to the panel, and thank you for presenting this this morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Ms. Hill for your beginning um, introduction and meditation around the indigenous people of America. Many of us are from the indigenous people, and in my lifetime, I have been renamed colored black and now I am an African American. It really disturbs me that someone other than what I look like can rename me and I just roll over and accept it. So a lot of this dialogue is great, but I do believe that we need to start at home amongst our own people, dialoguing and figuring out and knowing who we are. There has been no other ethnicity of people who don't know who they are and have been renamed so many times. Mm -hmm. So can we start some of these dialogues at home with our own? And once we come to a general consensus, then maybe we can bring this to the table with others and have a great discussion. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much for sharing that um, with us today. And I think it is very important for us to as individuals to have the power to, to identify ourselves and not have other people identify us. Um, that is important and that is a piece of structural racism. Um, so thank you for bringing that to light today. Um, another um, person stated, hosting awareness platforms, allowing others to speak openly and to listen with an open mind to understand. Um, and you'll notice I say participant, I don't say your names because we don't, we're not in a meeting setting where you could correct me if I misname you. So I, that's why I'm saying another participant. Um, to answer the dialogue question, I think that white people need to work to dismantle white supremacy as though their lives and their families' lives depended on it. Um, white folks need to have a sense of urgency for things to change. Um, I can consciously work to dismantle my own white fragility by allowing space for others to speak their minds. I can take an extra moment to think and consider possibilities before responding if what someone says feels like it is challenging my norm. Thank you so much for sharing um, your responses and your thoughts with us. Like I said, please continue to go ahead and put stuff in the chat. Kevin, can I say one thing about the previous slide um, as we move forward? Sure. So I just want to um, emphasize the word together, uh, uh, not in a way that's um, trying to sound sweet and nice, but in a way that's meant to be strategic. A lot of the comments were about how we speak to each other. And uh, when we're building teams to work together, we have to learn to be honest with each other, authentic. That's a place of, um, of um, where restorative dialogue is really needed so that we're working authentically together. Uh, I want to just highlight that the historical instances we've offered in this webinar, uh, Bacon's Rebellion and the Poor People's Campaign, as different as the motivations and goals of those two movements were, completely different, were both multi-ethnic coalitions. Uh, and they were both perceived as a direct threat to white supremacy. That is why they engendered the violent reactions that they, that they received. And so there's something about the power of multi-ethnic coalitions working for particularly political and economic justice uh, that goes to the heart of white supremacy. That is a work that we uh, do together. I want to just underscore that possibility of building teams that work together to build a part of it. We can see our prejudice on that 
and the listener what white supremacy is. We, we missed the last uh, three, about three sentences, Scott. Your mic uh, just, it just, I don't know what happened, but. All, all that I'm saying is multi-ethnic coalitions uh, confronting economic justice seem to go to the heart of what white supremacy is. Yes. Um, and I think, I think you're absolutely right, Scott. And I think it's also important. I think it needs to be multi-ethnic, but also I think um, I can see where the affinity space is also needed um, as well. So I think that's essential as well, doing it together in, in a multi-ethnic way, as well as in affinity spaces too. Absolutely, I, I, I don't need to cover over that or disagree with that, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and when we talk a, a, a lot, we we tend to focus on equality, which I think yesterday we said was a, was a really good thing. <laughs> it's definitely um, good to push for equality as per the opposite, uh, people not being equal at all, or things you know resulting in people not black people not being safe and murder. So if we're going to go for something other, <laughs> equality is definitely the way to go. But we also want to push past equality. Um, equality is, is not enough. And we've, we've seen that people, when people try to look for equality, they think you need the same things that they need. And well, lots of people go into communities and say, oh, good, this is what you need. We're going to give it to you. And you're like, actually, we have that. We actually need this over here. So there comes the time when asking people what they need um, is more important and gets at equity. It gets at access, um, equity being everyone getting what they need to survive <clears throat> or succeed, access to opportunity, networks, resources, and supports, where it's based on uh, where they are and where they want to go. And, and a lot of times that requires humility for us to um, realize that we don't know what everybody needs and that um, we, we want to ask each other what we need and push for more than equality, but for equity so that we all can reach um, the places where we want to go and, and our dreams and our hopes and, and safety. Uh, sometimes it's, oh, it's about, I just want to live in my neighborhood and be safe. Um, um, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dad. I'm sorry. It's, uh, I'm just looking at the time, Grand. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, what does uh, empire and by e equity look like? Uh, it looks like what we've been talking about: consciousness, where we consider self-evaluation, self-awareness reading um, and knowing kind of what is the context of the situation and where we live, the past, um, and, and getting, you know, just knowing what we need to do. And so we, we move towards equity with consciousness. And I think that's where we, a lot of people stay is getting real, real conscious. And so lately with the uh, uh, uprisings, people have been like, huh, what do I do now? <laughs> and so everybody, what do I do? What do I do? And we're skipping this, the second step of, of empathy uh, where you can actually get into someone else's mindset and, and see where, what they experienced and take a moment to, to see what it looks like in their actual situation. So it's a more feeling with, not feeling for. I'm actually feel with you. But I can't stop with feelings either. Is that where we get with guilt? Where we're talking about people getting stuck in guilt or are getting stuck in, in, I don't know what to do. And so we move toward, okay, well, if I, if I have empathy and I have consciousness and I want to take some action steps, I want to look at the community and work together together <laughs> in a way that moves us all forward. And so um, we have, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of um, ways that I'm sure you've seen people in your community um, act in, in an equitable way and see them uh, creating a, an equitable society. And we really need each other to be able to, to move forward in these ways. And so what does that embody look like? Have you seen it? <clears throat> Um, I want to speak just for a moment about the idea of mutual liberation. Uh, when we have these conversations, uh, very often uh, people of European descent, white folks, uh, will express feelings of guilt or embarrassment or shame. Um, and those feelings are not inappropriate. And we want to urge moving through them because they are a place where we get stuck and inadvertently recenter ourselves. So um, another thing that we see a great deal is the idea that we do this for other people. Also not a bad thing to feel, but it can become patronizing. It can get stuck in what I would call a philanthropic mindset, uh, where we're trying to help someone else with their problem and not realize our own place in this. 
part of what we want to suggest is that all of us are stuck in the system of white supremacy. Although it affects all of us very differently and we need to see those differences and realign our priorities based on those differences, hide that from ourselves and have a false sense of equality, as Evelyn's saying, nonetheless, we are all affected by it. And so white people also need to get free. This is a work of mutual liberation. I heard someone say earlier, white people need to work with the same urgency as if they and their families' lives depend on this, and that is dead on. Um, we are stuck in this too, and it is affecting us even if we can't see it, even if our privileges obscure that from us. If we could see it clearly, we would be horrified at what we see. So we want to urge a movement for equity where we're not only including or admitting a certain level of diversity, but where we genuinely share power in our organizations and in our work. That is what changes this. White supremacy is about white people having power. The thing that changes that is when we share power. Decision-making, leadership, resources. When we share power, we shift to sharing privilege, amplifying each other's voices, making space for each other sharing all that we have so that we can arrive at the point of creating a different world, a place where we can all be healed, where we are not acting in ways that are anti-human, anti-black, where people's lives are not threatened, uh, and where our own moral stuntedness or our imagination can be freed, where all people can be free. That's what we want to drive to. So how do we achieve equity for all? Um, we want to open up the, the opportunity for uh, maybe one person to speak and then also please use the chat. How do we achieve um, equity for all? And as people are um, sharing and thinking about writing in the chat and, and we get a person to share, uh, Dominique, I'd love it if you would, you know, just kind of share about what you think uh, an opportunity we've had for um, equity in, in our work together. Um, so, Speaking Down Barriers, like I said, we're a nonprofit organization. We really work to addressing issues of racism in our nation, um, speaking about that through dialogue. And we've had some affinity spaces that we've created. Um, so we have something called Healing Us for members of the African diaspora, Black people, to come and talk about the impacts of racism and ways in which we can heal. And then we have an affinity space for individuals of European descent who identify as white, um, to come together and learn about racism and um, how it impacts the white collective in this nation. And so we understand that our world doesn't, isn't just black or white people. We have indigenous people, we have members of the Latinx community, we have Asian, Asian Pacific Islanders. And so we were like, oh my gosh, how are we going to make sure that we facilitate an affinity space for said group, groups of individuals? And we've talked, we've reached out to Hispanic Alliance um, in our local community. We've spoken to other individuals from um, representing other groups, uh, racialized groups, and it's been challenging, but we've been intentional and purposeful of reaching out to people because we didn't want to be the ones to speak on their behalf, right? Mm -hmm. um, their experience is different and valid. And so what we've ended up having to do is collaborate with other individuals from other organizations. And one organization is Southerners on New Ground. And um, we have a Mexican individual as well as a Chinese American individual who um, led, helped co-lead um, what we now call seeing us. Because this is a, a space for individuals who are often marginalized in our society when it comes to talking about racism. And so that was one way. It took us three and a half years to get it into place, but we were hearing that. And yes, we could have gone ahead and done something on our own, but it would not have been as effective. It would not have been their voices. So that's just one example in which we try to have equity. Um, and we also recognize that it has to also be very diverse. So the individuals that we have, they're also individuals who um, are included in the LGBTQ plus community as well, because we understand that our freedom um, is interconnected and all these forms of oppression need to be eradicated. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, yeah. 
So true. It, it looks like uh, someone in the chat said uh, that we achieve equity for all through criminal justice reform, uh, removing people in power positions that are racist, and, uh, fe and feeding the system with more and more racism. So, yeah, totally true. <laughs> We've got to do something about the criminal justice um, reform. Also, to start treating everyone with respect, humility, and compassion. What's good for one should be good for all, despite of race, social economic status, etc. Yeah looking around and, and asking people what they need and providing access to everyone and, and valuing everyone, which is, you know, that's one of our um, strategic imperatives to value everyone, no matter whether we agree or not. Um, because my agree, whether I agree or understand your lifestyle, or doesn't mean anything when it comes to respect, understanding and access. Uh, it shouldn't even be a, a conversation. So thank you for sharing that. Did anyone want to share with their voice? We'd love to hear some an additional voice um, to share how to achieve equity for all. It's a big question, so <laughs> understand that it takes a little time to, to think it through. Uh, we were all working on this. <laughs> Inviting people to the table in professional circles, community development organizations, people who think they weren't inv invited in the first place. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. the time for people have built their own tables sometimes. I, I, I think that that uh, language about the table is really good. You know, the diversity and inclusion move is to invite people to the table who have been excluded. And that's a really strong first move. And then the further move to shared power is that people have not just representation, but a voice, vision making power, insight that shapes us, greater and greater representation. All those things that shift from uh, being a person in the room to being a person who is influencing the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and the last thing I'll share is from the chat is that um, we achieve equity for all, because if the school is the nexus of the school to prison pipeline, then we must take away the local control funding, which is directly based on like historical uh, redlining. Yeah, mm -hmm. so true. So true. Thank you so yeah. much. Like we said, we'll, oh, we we're going to go back and, and look at the chat um, and continue to read the thing. So even as we go on, if you have ideas about um, how you would think we achieve equity for all, please continue to put those in there. And so yesterday, um, we talked about what are some components that we believe are essential to having um, and facilitating restorative dialogue. And so we said it needs the intent should be for it to be transformative. It needs to be transformative and not superficial. Um, it needs to be one where there's trust, um, based on trust, right? And that trust comes from having the willingness and to be vulnerable by taking mutual risk, right? The parties that are involved are gonna be willing to engage in mutual risk taking. It takes time. You have to be intentional, but you also have to give it the time that it needs for it to occur. Um, consistent container. What are some guidelines to help that everyone's on the same baseline and understanding of how we're going to go about engaging in this dialogue? And then we recognize that there's going to be conflict. Conflict is uncomfortable, but it's necessary in some ways in order for us to grow, right? Um, and so these are some components that we think are essential in being able to facilitate restorative dialogue, especially with regards to issues of racism. So we talked about what can be very helpful but we also want to take a moment and talk about what can hinder um, restorative dialogue. And one thing that can really be fatal to genuine restorative dialogue um, is artificial harmony, creating an environment or fostering an environment of artificial harmony. And how does that happen? Usually, um, artificial harmony occurs when we're trying to um, avoid or ignore the difficult issues, when we're trying to suppress um, discussions about critical opinions or differing opinions from team members or from the standard norm. Um, and it also occurs when we inappropriately work from the thought process of we're all in this together. So we're all in this together, while that may be true, but we may not be experiencing it in the same way together. And so that's really important for us to understand. Um, in order for us to be able to maintain and have a restorative dialogue, we have to cut through this artificial harmony which we tend to do a great deal, unfortunately, because we're afraid of dealing with conflict. Conflict is essential, and it's important for us to know it's going to be inherently uncomfortable, and that's okay. Um, so if you can have those 
things in mind as you move forward to having restorative dialogue, we think it can be very helpful and transformative. Thank you, Dominique. And when we think about restorative dialogue and kind of bringing everything all together, what makes that dialogue able to heal anti-Blackness? So one thing we, I think we, you all said this in the chat as well, is that listening, uh, not to agree, but to understand. Um, and to understand that a lot of things happen because of context and not character. So when I can see that some of the decisions that were made, ah, I see power for sake of greed because you feel scarce and fear. And so you let that kind of control your thinking. Aha, I see why that happened. And so I can understand the context. And if I can understand that, then it's, I'm able to separate myself a little bit from um, the immediacy of people's decisions to understand where they came from so we can move forward to actually build community. Um, because if we, can't, we gotta do this together, as, as Scott brought up, you can't make change on, on your own. On your own, you can only take you know, step, small steps, but when you have the opportunity to uh, do that with somebody else, it makes a difference. And then in the end, we want to end all forms of oppression, all of them, uh, not just racism, but racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, and we can go on and on because let's be real, oppression is happening all day, every day to, to, to people who are different because of fear and we don't want to people don't want to lose resources and so in the end we want to end all of that and we want to work to value everyone at the same time because if we don't want to just switch the, flip the switch i don't want to be on top and be the person who's causing all of the oppression right i'm not trying to just slip it so it's black people now having all the power and then white people are you know um demeaned and disrespected and killed no that's not what we're after we want to value everyone so that we all have access and we all have the ability to get and live and have peace and and safety and so let's 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 get rid of it all and then let's value each other at the same time so that we do have equity for all and liberation is true for everyone we want to invite your questions um, you can put these in the Q&A box and uh, Kyle if you can help us with that We'll be happy to field any questions here as we um, move towards the end of the webinar. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for uh, really providing a, a really wonderful framework. Um, and thank you to the audience for being so engaged and curious and bright and really impactful. Um, you, you all are wonderful and I want to lift you all up and I just want to encourage you to ask any questions you may have in the Q&A box below. This is your opportunity to go ahead and do that so please by all means And while folks kind of put on their uh, thinking caps and their question hats, I actually had a question. Um, what recommendations do you have uh, to folks who work in the social service world? You know, oftentimes we come up against a lot of funding streams or um, structures uh, where, where uh, anti-Blackness scaffolds a lot of the uh, funding requirements. You know, how do you, how do you suggest someone uh, goes about addressing anti-Blackness within the very structures that we are working in, specifically funding? First of all, thank you for that question. Um, I think that shows uh, a level of, of conscious awareness and, and empathy and then wanting to make those changes. So thank you for that, that very question. Um, it's hard. You know, working within a system that is um, already anti-black, and then you come from a funding that is not going in in, in that direction. Um, I think one thing is to be able to find um, access outside of the system that offers funding, um, because the system is is created in such a way where you would have to be you know in a different position to be able to to change some of those. But also writing those letters, right? Like so, we do have the opportunity to to um, advocate on behalf of people and let people know that the system is 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 rigged against um, black people so writing letters and, and getting support to actually the people who make decisions and then helping people find access to resources outside of the system because there's lots of uh, private funding in, in ways that we can look for for grants and things that are um not so restrictive but you can still get it to the people that would be my advice 
think too that when we are in positions of serving on um, panels, serving on boards, serving on task forces, all those things that we may be asked to, to serve on when we're in a position of service or a position of leadership, to strongly advocate the people we presume to serve are also there serving. Mm -hmm. I recall um, in some of my congregational work being part of um, uh, an anti-poverty task force at a significant local philanthropy. And, and there's a group of people from social service agencies sitting around talking about anti-poverty programs and measures that could be taken collectively as a community. It's a great conversation, um, but there was not a single uh, poor person at the table. And when it was suggested that we not go any further until um, there was uh, uh, clear and well-represented uh, empowered representation from poor people at the table. When that was suggested as the next step, there was a visceral response by some people at the table. Why, why would we do that, right? And that's just ridiculous. Um, so I think another way to, to um, jar this is to insist that um, people that we presume to serve uh, are able to speak about the services that we're presumed influence what those are. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, looks like we did get a question in. Oh, we have two questions. Well, fabulous. Um, three questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. So the first question, do you think it's at all possible for Black people to be treated equally? That is a very Big question, and thank you. Thank you for asking that. Um, that is a very uh, loaded question for me, because just all the stuff that's been going on, we're, we see that right now, in, in the society that we're in right now, um, white supremacy is the most hostile it's been towards um, in a long time towards black people right now, uh, outside of enslavement. Um, in the last, I would say last five years, we see this is happening. And so do I think it's possible for us to be treated equally? Um, that's my hope. And I'm always optimistic that that's gonna happen, but it's not just gonna happen. It's something that we have to continue to, to fight for. And just like that participant stated that we have to be um, we have to fight like it's our life depends on it. And that's exactly what a lot of us are doing right now, because our lives do depend on us being able to get that equality and, you know, also trying to get the equity. But it's not going to happen just, you know, happenstance. We've seen that. History has shown us that all the civil rights movement, everything that we've had has never been just given. We've had to fight and, we, and we've had to fight with allies to help us. So it's never just by ourselves that we've been able to accomplish this, at least not in this nation. And so I think it's really important for us to be aware of that, that it takes intentionality, it takes sustained effort. So all the allies, advocates out here, it's going to take sustained effort um, and intentionality for that to happen, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a really heavy question and Dominique's answer uh, underscores the, the weight of it. Um, as a white person, I would say I cannot speak for what the world around me will do now or tomorrow, but it is not going to change unless I change. Mm -hmm. And so my work is to do it to my very best and to be willing to be criticized and to continue my transformation. That is the thing that will move the whole world. Um, and so uh, I just can't let the drag of society around me stop me from doing my damnedest. And um, my, one of my friends uh, and, and I facilitated with us, her name is uh, Crystal Tenille Irby. And um, she is a, she's brilliant, but she has a shirt uh, that says free grow. And that's a, a black person, a free black person living in an unfree world. And so there's part of this that deals with me being free end of myself and in my thoughts, no matter what the world around me says. So yes, black people can be treated uh, 
equally <laughs> where I am and in my world, like Scott was saying, because I'm doing my damnedest to make sure that I live free um, wherever I am and then pushing for that for all of us. Um, and, and, and like I said, in all the other ways that oppression shows up. Thank you, thank you. Um, where does reparations fit into this? It seems we are always begging and pleading to obtain services. Ooh. Well, I uh, wanted, uh, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say that it is vital to this uh, and um, essential to keep saying it and talking about it and pushing for it. Uh, and from my very limited perspective, where the conversation is today as opposed to four years ago, when ta Coates confronted Bernie Sanders during the 2016 presidential campaign, um, is, is light years in terms of open public conversation. I'm not trying to be falsely optimistic, but we have gone a long way in terms of collective thinking in four years. And there's a lot that's happened in those four years, but um, reparations have been afforded to many, many, many other groups around the world um, that have been um, exploited. And we need to keep saying the word and speaking the conversation all the time. In local vernacular, it would be run me my money. So yes, we're pushing for uh, reparations for all of us uh, that it would help so much with just the leveling of the playing field in mm -hmm. equity. So yes. And just, and just to underscore again, white supremacy is power for the sake of greed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is about greed. So reparations are not uh, in any way icing on the cake. Um, no. and it's, and it's not only about fairness, although that, that certainly is a, a huge part of it. Um, it's not only about writing a vast wrong of 500 years. Um, it is about the thing that goes to the heart of white supremacy and no wonder it's so, because white supremacy is power for the civil group and corporations are trying to speak. Um, so it looks like we are coming up just about t on time. Um, I want to take time for maybe one more question, and I would love for the facilitators, if you can see the questions on the back end, um, maybe pick the last one you all would like to address. Um, and just for the audience sake, uh, we are saving the chat and the Q&A so, so the facilitators can meditate and reflect on them as well. So your questions are still immensely valuable and will have impact. So thank you. Um, I would say we give Dominique last word, essentially, how do we break through artificial harmony? Thank you, Tal. Um, so one way in which we, we can break through um, artificial har harmony is facing our hard truths and understanding that there are multiple truths out there, right? Um, based upon our experiences. And we have to have room for open dialogue for us to be able to share, okay, this is what I'm experiencing. Um, but it is going to require taking mutual risk. Oftentimes, people who are marginalized in the society are asked to, you know, share their pain. And I'm not trying to pimp my, my pain for your benefit. And that's what happens oftentimes. So I need you to be willing to take the risk and feel vulnerable with me in this process. I need you to be willing to be uncomfortable to help me to maintain my safety when we're talking about anti-Blackness. So this is the context in which I'm speaking. Um, and so with regards to fighting and breaking through artificial harmony is recognizing that it's going to be uncomfortable. Conflict is inherently uncomfortable, but you can have it, you can have disagreement without being disagreeable. We've seen it, it happens all the time. Um, so that's important. And just being honest, I think that's really, really important. Uh, I wanna share a quote from a world-renowned um, creative, her and she also happens to be on our team. Her name is um, Crystal Irby. And I want to leave this with you. She says, our freedom, resistance, um, our healing, our, our resistance, and our freedom cannot mimic white supremacy. Our healing, 
our resistance and our freedom cannot mimic white supremacy. And that's what I would like to leave with you today to think about. Um, we talked about that yesterday, what white supremacy looks like, how it shows up, white fragility, um, white privilege. We talked about internalized um, oppression, anti-blackness. Ask yourself and challenge yourself to recognize um, how these things show up in your life and recognize that your healing, resistance, and our freedom cannot mimic white supremacy. I thank you immensely, Philadelphia Fight, for allowing us to be here, providing this opportunity for us. We appreciate being here. We are your cousins, your internet cousins from South Carolina. Um, thank you once again for allowing us to be part of this process. We hope to see you again. We do have some events. These are free events that we ask that you join. Um, come, please feel free to email us at info at speakdownbarriers.org. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Padrine, Scott, and Davlin uh, for your insight, expertise, and caring. Um, and once again, thank you to our audience members who participated in the chat, as well as uh, shared their voices with us. You are all fabulous. Um, as a note, uh, when this closes out, there will be a survey. Just let us know how, how this went and how we're doing. Um, and thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good weekend as we approach it and take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Kyle. You're the best. Yes, Kyle. Thank oh, you. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody have a, have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.